If the fever is lower than 102, then actually what we want to do is we want to actually raise it. So if it's 100, 101, we don't want to suppress it. We want to actually raise it to a higher level so that the body can fight off the pathogen even better. So to raise the fever, there's two ways of doing this, and these are following the principles of hydrotherapy, which I will continue to talk about in these lectures, not only talking about homeopathy, but also about hydrotherapy and how that really, can be a really great adjunct to homeopathy. And hydrotherapy is basically using water, cold or hot, to affect the movement of the blood in the body in very beneficial ways. The, the hydrotherapists dating back from the 1800s, they treated everything just with water. They treated pneumonia, bronchitis, um, rheumatic pain, musculoskeletal pain, infections, all kinds of things with actually remarkable success 200 years ago. And, um, you know, it's been something that has been, it's a little time consuming sometimes and cumbersome, but the, the hydrotherapy that I'm going to be sharing with you, I've selected kind of the easiest, simplest method. So they're not really very hard and they can make a big difference as a complement to the remedy. Generally speaking, if you find a good remedy, it's going to work faster than the hydrotherapy. So you want to know that the remedy is working first before you start doing the hydrotherapy. But if you, can, if you don't have access to a remedy, if you don't have access to a homeopath, it can be done in, uh, as an alternative to. Or if you're really having trouble finding a good remedy that's working, it can be done as an alternative to. Or if the remedy's working but you want to, once you've established the remedy's clearly working and you're going to continue with it, then you could add the hydrotherapy in, knowing that it's only going to enhance what, or what the remedy is already doing. You want to try to, if you can, get an idea of what the patient's response is to the remedy first, see that it's good, you're on the right track, then add the hydrotherapy. That would be the best way to do it. And Mina, did you have a question or did that answer? Okay. Um, so to raise the fever, there's a couple ways to do this. One is a hot foot bath for about 12 minutes. Um, so you, get, you sit over the edge of a bathtub, get the uh, tub or a bucket of water, put the feet all the way up to the, it could be just the feet and ankles or all the way up to the knee um, for 12 minutes, followed by a cold compress to the abdom, abdominal region, navel region for about 10 minutes. A cold compress is just a, um, cold, a cloth in damp cold water that you just apply and just leave it there for 10 minutes. The other way, a more drastic way to raise uh, body temperature would be to do a full body hot bath. So you get in the bathtub, everything is, is you're covering the entire body in hot water, um, except for the head. The head's out of the water and you've got a cold compress on the head. You even use an ice, an ice pack. Then when you get out of the bath, then you do that same cold compress to the navel, and then follow with a heating compress to the feet. A heating compress to the feet is a, is a really good, um, tool that we're going to talk about over and over again. Uh, basically, what this does is this is an overnight treatment, ideally, that increases circulation to the feet. And if you increase circulation to the feet, you're increasing circulation throughout the entire body. So the way to do a heating compress to the feet is you take um, two cold, uh, you take two cotton socks, get them wet in cold water from the tap, wring them out, make them damp, put them on both of your feet, then put on a thick pair of dry wool socks over that, or even two pairs of wool socks, and just go to sleep. Or it, spend at least an hour or two like that. What will happen is the, um, that will increase the blood circulation to the feet. When you wake up or a few hours later, the feet will be dry and warm. Uh, so that's how, you would, that's how you could potentially raise fever. To lower fever, uh, so if it does get to dangerously high levels and you don't want to give a conventional um, medical drug, what you can do is, um, uh, first of all, don't attempt to lower the fever if the patient's sweating. If the patient's sweating, that's a sign that they're on their way to lowering the fever naturally, so just let it sweat. Um, but if you want to try to lower the fever, you're going to sit the patient in a tub of water, uh, just a, a bathtub, and just pour water um, either somewhere between 81 to 92 degrees or 93 to 96 degrees over the neck and shoulders. So you put it in like a, a bucket or a pail and just pour that water like that. Um, the 81 to 92 degrees will, uh, will, will do a better job of uh, lowering the temperature, but if the patient's too chilly and can't tolerate it and gets really uncomfortable and starts shivering, then go with the 93 to 96 degree water. Um, Question. 
Yes. Is that Dr. Kellogg at Battle Creek Sanitarium started using yes. hydrotherapy a lot for yeah, yeah, yeah. elimination of toxins mm-hmm. as opposed to the ice cold baths for fevers? Right. Dr. Kellogg is one of the founders of hydrotherapy. Right. So. Exactly. Um, the information I'm conveying to you is, is uh, based on Kellogg and Carol, and there's a few others um, right. from, the, from those times. Uh, the other thing you can do, so then after that, after the pouring the water, then you would go to a neutral bath, or this is a this is this could be done after, or in addition to, uh, or as an alternative to, just sitting in a neutral bath, which is a bath of 93 to 97 degrees for one to three hours. Um, the other thing you could do is if the patient is patient's really chilly, um, you'd start. Um, with the water um, just slightly lower than body temperature. I'm not sure why there's a four star there. I, that's some kind of typo. So you'd start in a bath, you start the patient off in a, ba- in, a, in a bath of water that's just slightly below their temperature. So if their temperature is uh, you know, 103, make it 102 or 101. And then this way, this is for the more sensitive or chilly patient. And then while they're in the water, you gradually lower the water temperature to neutral or slightly cooler. This is a gradu- it's a graduated bath, meaning it gradually gets cooler and cooler so the patient can tolerate it better. And then in the meantime, their body temperature is coming down. Uh, the other trick you can do is the hot evaporating sheet. Um, you get the sheet wet with as water as hot as possible, wring it out, apply it over the entire body, apply friction through the sheet so you can just be like rubbing it like this. Um, so that the patient doesn't get so cold and it stimulates, it enhances the effect of the treatment. And then um, you repeat this every five to eight minutes or when the patient becomes chilly. When the patient becomes chilly, you stop, let them cover up. The reason why the hot evaporating sheet works is because it starts out hot, so it feels good to the chilly patient, but then as it evaporates, you're applying the friction. As the water evaporates, it cools the patient. Works that way. Uh, the other thing, the other way to do this would be a tepid sponge bath. So there's all these different ways of doing it. The last way would be a tepid sponge bath. You take 81 to 92 degrees of water um, with a big sponge and friction, rub the patient's body with it. And add, again, the friction keeps them from getting chilly, but in the meantime, the water's evaporating from the skin, which dramatically cools the, the patient off. Okay. Um, in the event of a cold or a flu, um, A really good way, aside from remedies and all this, um, a great way to treat it is to skip the next two meals. So the very first time sign of symptoms, just stop eating. The whole notion of uh, starve uh, starve a fever and feed a cold or whatever, (laughs) just starve everything. (laughs) Starve a cold, starve a flu, starve a fever, starve an ankle sprain, any kind of injury. Whenever your body's under stress, if you stop eating and just drink a lot of water, um, it's going to enhance your body's ability to heal because a tremendous a percentage of uh, the body's energy is spent on digestion. So if you remove that energy it has to spend on digestion, it can spend its energy in more productive ways. And usually you're not so hungry during those times anyway. You notice animals in the wild when they're sick, they go off in the corner, they rest, and they don't eat, and they just drink water. So that's what we should do as well. Uh, you can drink one glass of water every 10 minutes for the first hour to really flush that out and raise the body temperature with the hot bath again. So you're doing a lot of passive sweating, you're raising the body temperature, drinking a ton of water, getting rid of a lot of toxins, and not burdening the body with all this food that it has to try to digest. If you're gonna eat anything at all, the best thing to do is just vegetable juices, because fruit juices are high in sugar, which suppresses the immune immune system, you don't wanna do that. Um, But the vegetable juices are gonna be the easiest thing for your body to assimilate. It doesn't have to do a lot of work on digestion or absorption. You're getting tons of antioxidants in that as well. Can you add broth? Like cool? Yeah, I mean, you know, can you add broth to it? Yeah, I mean, the, the you know, the less you have, the less your body has to work, the better. So the worst thing to do would be to have, you know, a steak and potatoes. <laughs> you know, so the closer you can go to just vegetarian or food that's very easily digestible, the better. Better it's going to go.